My name is Les Young. I'm a licensed architect in both New York State and in California. Uh, I've been involved in many large projects, including uh, overseeing several high-rise buildings ranging in size from 14 stories to 40. Uh, over the course of 20 years, I'm mainly called in to help with very large, difficult projects. One of the more notable projects was 55 Second Street in San Francisco. Um, I was involved in getting the permits for the Infinity Towers, which are uh, two residential towers right on the edge of the bay in San Francisco. And interestingly enough, I was also involved in 350 Bush for Shorenstein Realty, and Ron Hamburger was the structural engineer working with me on that project right across the street from the Bank of America Tower at the time of the attacks in 2001. Ron Hamburger was uh, one of the engineers involved in the official reports investigating the uh, collapse on 9-11. Uh, um, prior to going to architecture school, I was a professional firefighter in Dayton, Ohio for four years. Um, I first became suspicious as I watched the towers collapse. Um, I couldn't help but notice that they looked like a controlled demolition because I personally witnessed a controlled demolition in, in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, when they tore down a high-rise uh, building on our campus. Uh, we were sitting right across the street. The first thing I noticed was that uh, the buildings did not fall the way I would have expected them to fall. From watching the reruns of the planes and how they kind of hit one side or uh, impacted one side more than the other, even if it was in the center, um, I would not have expected the whole building to just give in at once. And I thought it rather odd that they um, fell almost perfectly in very similar ways. Um, it seemed odd that lightning would strike twice, and I became highly suspect when Building 7 also collapsed and a plane hadn't even hit it. And that's when I began my uh, research and getting online and crying foul. I started digging really deeper and trying to use my skills as an architect to see what I could uh, give to the community, the 9-11 Truth community, especially the families and the families of the firefighters. I wanted to back them up 100%. The kind of uh, high-rise buildings I worked on generally have a strong core and weaker, not as strong, perimeter columns. And the two act together to help overturning and lateral forces. So I do know that the World Trade Center, because of its height, had an extremely strong core of, I believe, 47 massive columns in the center, surrounded by these perimeter columns. Uh, and then that helped with the, the tilting in the wind. Uh, it's still tilted. People would actually get seasick at the top. I've never been to the top, but I've spent a lot of time at the bottom, so I've, I've seen them up close. And it again, when I watched them fall, I could not see how those massive, very thick columns could just snap like that. I would have expected them to, most of them to stay uh, intact with the floors collapsing around them. And what we should have had was a bunch of floors pancaked at the bottom with these spikes sticking out. But the fact that it was all reduced to rubble and powder uh, just did not make sense at all. And the way the beams and the window mullions and things went up and out. That kind of stuff can't happen with just pure air pressure of floors getting sandwiched together. And also knowing the melting temperatures of steel and, and, and kerosene and jet fuel, uh, knowing that it takes a blast furnace with air blowing with blowers to try to get steel to melt. I knew that uh, the steel couldn't melt and uh, become... Um, uh, molten with those kinds of materials just burning uh, in open air. Just a lot of things didn't make sense. When the upper portion of the North Tower uh, was destroyed and began to come down, I thought that given the way the planes hit the building, uh, one side would have given away first and it, it just would have fallen off or fallen over at a steep angle, but the way the whole thing just gave way at once and 
started to plummet down without slowing down as it went down. Um, again, just like the controlled demolition I witnessed personally, uh, it just was going so rapidly down, it just didn't add up the way the whole thing uh, sort of pile drove itself into the ground and uh, all at near free fall speed. The uh, impact of the floors pancaking upon themselves would create gushes of air out the side, but not the kind of explosive force that we saw that would throw I-beams across the street into the windows of other buildings. When the South Tower was destroyed, at first it looked like it was going to land in the street or take a building out next to it, and then all of a sudden it disappears in this huge cloud of smoke, uh, which didn't seem to make sense at the time uh, as to how the whole thing could just sort of cave in on itself and um, disappear into a pile of, of, of rubble like that so completely without um, anything sticking up, left over, um, the building falling sideways. And again, this, this uh, explosive force that um, was blowing debris across the street um, I would not have expected from just the floors pancaking and uh, the gushing air pushing heavy steel up and out against gravity. Um, as odd as uh, the North and South Towers were to me um, and seemed suspicious and I watched with disbelief, when I watched Building 7 collapse, it basically left no doubt in my mind that something was wrong. Um, Building 7 had not been hit by a plane. Um, there were a few small fires, but uh, the fact that it fell in on itself in just six seconds in a classic controlled demolition fashion left no doubt in my mind that something was wrong. And the fact that no one was talking about that, uh, to me it was obvious that there was some controlled demolition and some explosions involved, but I, I would have thought that it would be obvious and that they would be bringing this up and looking into it and investigating the explosions in the, in, in the way that these buildings fell. And uh, that's when a lot of us joined forces and uh, decided to look into it deeper on our own. Uh, in my previous career as a firefighter, uh, normally you'd never be afraid to go into a type one building because they're not combustible and you would just charge at it and put the fire out. Um, I remember as building, uh, North and South Towers were burning, all that was going through my head was the plane that crashed into the Empire State Building. And the firefighters merely went up and eventually put the fire out. Uh, we've all seen news clips of uh, high-rise buildings burning in South America and in Spain, and eventually the firefighters were able to put them out, and just a few floors were burnt. And uh, that was kind of the response uh, I expected to see that day. And I'm sure the firefighters, that's what was going through their heads. But never uh, in my training were we ever taught that these type of buildings could just collapse in on themselves. And the wood frame building, yeah, that happens all the time. But not a type 1, type 2 high-rise building. There's definitely much more going on than just fire. Uh, the jet fuel can't get hot enough to make an entire building uh, just collapse in on itself like that. Um, what a lot of people I don't think realize is that the majority of the jet fuel was burnt up instantly in the big fireball, and it was gone. The fires that were left were office furnishings and carpet and things like that. A lot of things in these kind of buildings have to be fire resistant by nature. It's required by code. So there really isn't a whole lot of fuel in there to begin with. But the jet fuel argument just doesn't cut it with me. Because when, when that big fireball came out of the, both the towers, that was the jet fuel. And it pretty much was over at that point. And uh, NIST even acknowledged that uh, the rest of the fuel that was left over, unburned, uh, would have burned up within 10 or 15 minutes after the uh, initial explosion, which would have resulted in normal office fires with a lot of paper, furnishings, things like that, which could still do a lot of damage. It's just that the buildings did not come down from 
hours and hours of jet fuel burning within the building. I signed the petition on the uh, Architect and Engineers 9-11 Truth uh, website mainly because I wanted to uh, stand behind the families that lost people on 9-11. Uh, the 9-11 Truth Movement was started by the families uh, that lost loved ones on that day, and they were very upset at the way they were being treated and asked to be quiet. Um, it, it really upset me that our own government wasn't backing these people up, and I was watching the funerals of the firefighters, and as an ex-firefighter uh, in the Firefighters Union, I wanted to give... Uh, my old firefighting brothers and sisters, uh, the support they needed, and to back them up as an architect now because I can't do it as a firefighter. I just felt like they were all out there alone, screaming for help, and our own country was ignoring them and ignoring their needs and not taking care of them the way we should have after that happened. And so I'm going to do everything I can to continue that fight and not give up and... Uh, stand behind them 100%. The reason uh, I still stand behind a new investigation is uh, I think enough time has passed that people are starting to wake up and they're realizing that we're all not a bunch of conspiracy nuts and people are beginning to listen whereas I don't think they were capable of listening before and we need to come together again as a country. Uh, I believe that this one event split our country in half. And the only way we're going to come back together is to reopen the wound, talk about this in an open dialogue, and I'm talking everyone, the debunkers and the conspiracy theorists and everyone, come together, uh, relook at the evidence. Um, I think it's very important that it be an independent commission uh, I don't think any of us are coming to conclusions or pointing fingers at this time. We're just saying, let's reopen it. Let's look at it objectively. Let's look at the evidence, not these fabricated computer models and hearsay and all these predetermined conclusions. Uh, let's really open it up again and um, investigate this thing properly and then come to conclusions.